So they went off, and he went out again around noon. And around 3 o'clock he did likewise. Going out about 5 o'clock he found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand there idle all day? They answered him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started at five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought they'd receive more. But each of them also got the usual daily wage. Now receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the heat? He said to, them, to, he said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Do not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish my, with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let's take a few moments just to kind of glance at that passage again on our own. I did a baptism of a elderly woman on her bed. She was best friends with a Catholic. Uh, they went to grade school and elementary school together, but her parents were not Catholic. And she went through her whole entire adult life uh, not claiming of religion. And her husband was very anti-Catholic, so even as her, in her older life, she wanted. There were times where she f said, "Okay, I'm going I'm to join the church," and her husband would make comments. Her husband passed away, and she was at this point elderly and infirm, and at the really, it was actually less than 48 hours before she died. Uh, her family contacted me, and. I was able to be with her whole family in her bedroom and we prayed and she made a profession of faith and she confessed uh, her life and her sins and she was baptized and salvation was given to this woman and it was really one of these very powerful powerful moments I remember uh, sharing this story a few days later and there was a good God-fearing woman who, you know, worked and volunteered at the church and helped out with things, went to Mass every single one, every, every weekend, and would fast and pray and do all these great things. And I remember when she heard about this, she, she goes, that's not really fair. And I just said, excuse me? I said, this woman, like, was given the gift of eternal life, like, literally 48 hours before she died. And she goes, but, like, she didn't have to do anything. To me, it's always that, that's the story that I always automatically go to when I hear the scripture passage. There's, there's a master, of course, an image of our Lord, and... He goes out into the marketplace and he sees people who aren't working. And he's like, do you want a job? And they all agree to go out at different times during the day. And then he pays them at the end of the day, but they all get the same reward. They all get the same profit, whether they worked all day or just for a few hours. And it's very interesting. I think it's very, very interesting that the master 
chooses to give the payment in the way that he does. Notice how he very easily could have starved with the people that he hired at 9 o'clock and, and been like, hey, here's your money, get out of here. And he could have given the money, but he doesn't. I think it's, it's always good to ask the question, why? Well, why? Because I think a very clear point is being made. That our salvation is rooted in us following the Lord whenever that begins and whenever that starts. And our God is so merciful and so generous with his grace and with his mercy. And we're called to just rejoice that anyone gets it. If we look at it from the point of view of... Um, so those people who are in the marketplace, and I've heard many different ministers preach on this passage and what have you, and oftentimes, you know, they'll say that the people that were in the marketplace in the mid-afternoon, they were there in the morning as well. They just didn't go out and work. They didn't accept the invitation. But they still had families. They still had mouths to feed. They still had situations that needed some sort of uh, profit. And I think oftentimes it's, it's so good, it, it's good for us and challenging for us to, to take ourselves out of that sense of like, I earned this mentality, I, I deserve this mentality, and, that, and to go better into the sense of, I've received, and I'm blessed because of that, and what I, what I do receive really does affect not just me, but it affects the lives of others. Um, by us receiving the gift that we receive, uh, it also makes a great effect in the life of others. And, um, and the same is true with our salvation. Um, in God's eternal plan, your acceptance of Christ and your acceptance of the gospel message at whatever age you are at and whatever age you are at is that's part of God's plan. And God's going to give you your, your reward for that. Um, and we should be thankful that anyone ever chooses, no matter what stage or what place that they are at, that, 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 that they make that choice. That's the tremendous... Uh, I think, yeah, that's the, the tremendous gift that's given to us. Um, so this passage, very, very much so rooted in God's mercy, rooted also in the fact that our salvation uh, is about us choosing and us acting, but it is very much so about the, the great gift that is given to us, and more so on the great gift that's given to us, um, without a doubt. Other questions, thoughts, or reflections on today's passage? Yes? Uh, I kind of very grateful that I'm allowed to work in the vine yard even though I didn't start early in the morning. It gives me hope and I feel like, well, okay, I got in there kind of in the late afternoon, but I'm going to work as hard as I can because I want the kingdom of God, the vineyard, to succeed. And praise be to God that we have a lot of people here that are Maybe going to do a little cleaning or cleaning or whatever in the vineyard of God to keep it going. That's beautiful. And I think it was so, I mean, for many of you have jobs, and I, that's the type of, that, that's the employee that you want. The employee that's not there not just to get paid. And every church has this. The church has, every church has people that are there just because they want salvation. But then there's also people that are in the church because they want the church to flourish. They want the church to burst at the seams with people who are having life changing experiences they want people to uh you know to to see the yeah the church grow i think that image of the vineyard growing and and, and blooming is, is a beautiful image of what we desire um, and what full-fledged active participation in the church fosters uh yeah yes uh I just had a revelation tonight that I'm very familiar with the, uh, with the parable and the different people coming in at different times and getting paid the same wage. But I missed that first phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner. And I forgot that this was really um, tying, it, tying it into heaven and our salvation. And it was like a, kind of like a, a ha thing for me right now, which kind of amazing. Uh, as many times as I've read it, 
And that key, that, that, that key, that's a key phrase there, the kingdom of heaven is like a landlord. If you miss that part, it's a, it's a great story if you just read the rest of it too. But I think uh, salvation and heaven are a pretty important part of it. Uh, some of you may have heard is of uh, for those of you who know who, who know world history. Emperor Constantine was the Roman emperor who ultimately converted to Christianity, and because of his conversion to Christianity, led to the flourishing of Christianity. The Holy Roman Empire is is uh, suppressed. Christianity in its early flourishing, in the days when it should have been flourishing. Uh, Emperor Constantine's mother was a Christian, and he ultimately did convert to Christianity. But it's really interesting. Um, as the Roman Catholic Church does not put an ST in front of Constantine's name. Other Christian groups do, but we don't. And there's a reason that we don't, as Roman Catholics. Emperor Constantine intentionally delayed his baptism and his confession. He believed in Christianity. He grasped the concept of it. His mother begged him to convert. And he was baptized on his deathbed. The Catholic Church looks at that as different than the situation that I explained at the beginning of my story today, of, 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 of my reflection today. Uh, I will make jokes sometimes when people are getting ready for adult baptism. I'll be like, go out and get your sin and done today because tomorrow is going to be forgiven. <laughs> if it's about a relationship, then like doing that isn't thinkable. And that was one of the struggles that the church had with Constantine was like, okay, we realized that like, yeah, you got baptized and then you died like a few days later, but you were intentionally delaying that so that you could live the life that you were living in. Being a, a worker who goes out into the vineyard late, if you're intentionally sitting there waiting uh, with <coughs> the knowledge that you're going to get the payment, these individuals went out into the vineyard not knowing what payment they would get. But because the landowner is merciful and just, he, he gave the full payment. The Catholic Church is not saying that Emperor Constantine did not go to heaven. The Church is not saying that. But the Church is not going to elevate him to a model of sanctity because it's not a practice that they would like everyone to. If that's the case, I would still be in college. Uh, just totally chilling and <laughs> hanging out with my bros. Um, and so would a lot of people. And um, the church is making it very clear that, in fact, the earlier you're able to join in, thanks be to God, because then you're able to work in the vineyard of the Lord, and you're able to participate in those great gifts uh, that the church offers, which is the sacraments, which is uh, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which are so beautiful and such a great part of, of the tradition of, of Christianity. So the earlier we can get in, let's do it. And that's why we're here. It's, it's really a, it's, it's a daily, you know, this, this passage can also just be not looked at as a one-time thing, but as a daily thing. Like, do I daily start my service of the Lord, or is it just a, is it a later part of my life? Is it, is it is a later part of my day? Is it my whole day, or is it just part of my day? Is it my whole life, or just part of my life? It's a question that can be asked continually um, uh, for those who choose to follow the Lord. So... This will be this weekend's gospel passage, so a little bit of a, a heads up there. I like to do videos uh, when I can because I think videos are great. We're going to watch this first video um, of this year, and you're just going to love it, I hope. Um, it is a video that I think just gives a quick glimpse of Roman Catholicism, and then we're going to look at... oh. And can we grab those lights back there? I have no idea which switch it is, but it'll work. So um, I'll just show you what I love about this film even before you watch it. I love this little <coughs> clip 
because it really shows the diversity of the church, like in the sense of the universal church, that the church embraces people of all ethnicities, all languages, all time. It also talks about some of the fruits that the church uh, has been able to foster through universities and medicine and education. So, but it's ultimately all rooted in our Lord. So here we go. Our family is made up of every race. We are young and old, rich and poor, men and women, sinners and saints. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We establish orphanages and help the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing relief and comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other scholarly or religious institution. We developed the scientific method and laws of evidence. We founded the college system. We defend the dignity of all human life and uphold marriage and family. Cities were named after our revered saints who navigated a sacred path before us. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have consistently guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith, for centuries we have prayed for you and our world, every hour of every day, whenever we celebrate the Mass. Jesus himself laid the foundation for our faith when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. For over 2,000 years, we've had an unbroken line of shepherds, guiding the Catholic Church with love and truth in a confused and hurting world. And in this world filled with chaos, hardship, and pain, it's comforting to know that some things remain consistent, true, and strong, our Catholic faith, and the eternal love that God has for all creation. If you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Ours is one family, united in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We are Catholic. Welcome home. That was, the, this little video is actually a clip. Our family is... Ah, it's actually a clip from, um, there were some, uh, a few years back there were some Catholic businessmen that got together and hired a, out of their own money and funds, hired a film company to make some commercials that would be that would air like during the Super Bowl and stuff to try to bring people who had fallen away from the practice of religion back to back to the faith and and that's where that clip actually actually came from. Is it actually was a commercial that aired during the Super Bowl one year? Um, we talked a little bit for those of you who are at our intro session, just like. What are some of the reasons that you might be coming to these classes or reasons that you're interested uh, in joining the church? I wanna shift tonight to a different question a little bit, but many, everyone comes, Catholic or non-Catholic, comes to the church with preconceived ideas, thoughts that have been put into our mind either through our own study, or through the mass media, or through family, or through friends, or through classmates, or what was said on the playground when you were at school, or what was said in your uh, philosophy class, or history class, or ethics class in college. <coughs> we all have a lot of ideas about what the Catholic Church is, either in, both in positive and in negative. Uh, there's a lot of, th we're one of the most heated topics uh, often uh, in the world, even when it comes to politics today. So I just want to begin uh, today just with an ability for us to say, we'll talk about negative things as well later, but I like, I'm a very positive person. So what are, some, what are some things that you know about the Catholic Church, or what are reasons why you believe that either choosing to be a Catholic or uh, things that you find, about, find the church to be beautiful? We're going to actually go through a sheet. Um, in just a second called 20 reasons uh, to be Catholic but I thought that it'd be great to see if we could cover some of these as well uh, on our own before we go through this little handout that I've made for all of us so anyone what are some reasons to be Catholic what are, what are, what are some positive aspects of the Catholic Church that um, that we know about my studies, I'm not Catholic, but 
Great question. So, <clears throat> um, who has the authority to declare what is morally right, what is morally wrong in a world? Who has the authority to declare what books are in the Bible? Who has the authority to say who is Jesus Christ as true God and true man? Who has, where, where does the authority to declare what is theologically accurate or correct? That's a beautiful reason, a big reason why many people uh, look to the Catholic faith. Anyone else? Yeah. So for, for me, one of the things has been the history, because a lot of times in the in the Protestant tradition, you skip all the hundreds of years, all the centuries from like Acts, you know, or, or the New Testament to like today. And so I've read through some of the early church fathers and seeing the parallels with the Catholic Church today was really striking. I have a document. Remind me that I'll, I'll, I'll be true to this, so please but remind me. I have a very good priest friend of mine on the East Coast, and he's made this, this, this beautiful little document. I have, I'm not always consistent on handing it out, but it looks at <clears throat> three gospel writers, three church fathers, and three church teachings. Anyways, it's, it's this great little parallel where it just it really kind of goes through. And the whole intent of it is to say what they were saying in Scripture is what the early church fathers say, and which is what the church is still saying today. So you see that consistency in the, in the tradition of teaching. Anyone else? Positive things about the Catholic Church or reasons why people should think about being Catholic that are good? Yes? I just say the importance of education in the church and also the service, you know, all the service that the church does so they, 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 the world. And th thank you. When the Catholic Church was being attacked very much so after the priest scandal that broke out in the early uh, 2000s, uh, which we will talk about whenever anybody wants to talk about it. It's an absolute atrocity. Uh, but a Jewish man came to the defense of the Catholic Church and wrote a article ultimately saying, would everyone stop attacking the Catholic Church? And could we please talk about what the Catholic Church has done to the world? And he goes on to say that what we know of as education, what we know of as universities, what we know of as the scientific method, what we know of as really modern society was, was very much so formed and brought out through religious sisters, religious brothers, and Catholic institutions. First, the first hospital and all the hospital system was ultimately developed by the Catholic Church. And it's not at all trying to boast or saying we're better, but like it is true that it is the largest organization in the world that cares for the poor and for the needy and for the homeless. Not, we don't say that to boast, but it, this is a Jewish man that started this, and, not, and that, you heard it. You heard it in there as well. But he's quoted now, uh, Matthew Kelly, who gets a lot of verbiage. He constant, that, that's one of his big things. Um, the Catholic Church often gets beat up, but the Catholic Church is also, also tremendously important when it comes to education and formation and charity and mission in the world. Uh, and it often does it very, very invisibly, uh, often unseen. Uh, you'll hear, because I talk a lot about these experiences that I have with young people. We went down to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, good evening, Keith. We went down to Hurricane Katrina uh, in 2005 and six. Uh, I took five mission trips of young people down there. And um, we, uh, this past year actually, we just went, we did a hurricane. The, how do we define God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? three persons and yet one God. The, the, the catechism fleshes out what is in here, but it also fleshes it out with good theology, philosophy, and reason, and puts it in a, in a, in a, in a digestible term. Uh, it's very, 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 very helpful and highly footnoted. Number eight, the Catholic Church enjoys the ongoing presence of Jesus Christ in its churches. The Eucharist is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. He is here. <clears throat> Uh, one of the reasons why I am Catholic is because of the true presence of the Eucharist, because of what the Catholic Church has persisted in teaching about our Lord 
being truly present and the fulfillment of John chapter 6. Number nine, only the Catholic Church enjoys a universal leader. I don't know why there's an apostrophe after the. The Pope, who is a descendant of St. Peter, who was appointed by Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 16. And the word Pope is derived from Papa or Father. So the, the Pope is, when we talk about authority or we talk about where we look to or who we look to, uh, when it comes to matters of morals or faith, we do have the ability to look towards a leader to give us guidance and give us direction. Uh, real quick, we do not believe that he's God or that if he says that he likes decaffeinated coffee over regular coffee, that, that that's infallible or that you have to believe that. Um, if he said he likes Christmas more than Easter, we don't care about that either. But anyways, um, the Catholic Church possesses the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So that's uh, Matthew 16, uh, which ultimately is, is a biblical passage about the founding of the church and the authority that she has. The Catholic Church enjoys a valid priesthood, each priest having been ordained by apostolic succession, the original apostles. So I was ordained by, I was originally ordained by Cardinal, Ju uh, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, I was ordained in Rome, a deacon, by Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who's now the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, uh, in New York City, and so we actually can go through a hand of laying on accession, succession of back to the apostles with all of our bishops and thus all of our priests as well. Ultimately, uh, a man is ordained by the laying on of hands, uh, a bishop lays hands upon a priest. Um, it takes two bishops, it takes three bishops to ordain one priest uh, for to ensure that the ordination is valid and that it is intended to take place. So without priests, we don't have the Eucharist. Without priests, we don't have valid sacraments um, for the most part. So priests are a pretty vital part of the Catholic Church. Number 12, the Catholic Church appoints its priests to parishes out of obedience and faithfulness. So I'm here at All Saints Parish out of obedience and faithfulness, and now I'm here because I love it. Um, priests are not elected by a board of directors or a church council. So it's different than other denominations. Uh, All Saints doesn't choose me, and they can't fire me. Well, <laughs> there are ways to get rid of a priest, but, uh, <laughs> but technically, um, it's ultimately the decision of the bishop, not the decision of the pastor. Uh, many of you know that I was brought here in the middle of March. I was literally called up by my bishop and said, you're going to leave your parish. And I said, okay. And I thought it was like, we normally make transitions in July. And he said, I said, he met, I met with him on, on February 19th. And I said, uh, when am I going to do this? And he said, March 1st. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, and he said, yeah, and nobody's allowed to know until March 1st, and you're gonna arrive at the parish on March 8th. Oh, okay, so I had five, I had five business days to pack up and move, it was awesome. Uh, but it really was awesome, because it's obedience. And obedience is one of the greatest things in the world. It really is, I love obedience. Number 13, the Catholic Church has bishops that teach, govern, and sanctify. Catholic bishops are shepherds to a diocese. So diocese are, well, actually I think it explains, that usually embrace a large territory. Uh, in which is located a number of priests, parishes, and ministries, hospitals, universities, food pantries, homeless shelters, and the bishop ultimately has authority over all of them. So you are currently in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. So if you go to Indianapolis and you take like 86th Street all the way across the state of Indiana, including Terre Haute and Richmond, and then drop all the way down, that's the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, except Evansville. Evansville is a diocese of itself. In Indiana, we also have the Diocese of Lafayette, so there's Indianapolis, Evansville, Lafayette, and then Fort Wayne, South Bend, and Gary. So there's five dioceses in the state of Indiana. We are the only archdiocese, which technically means that we have governance as an archdiocese over the other four dioceses. It's called, just like anything else, this is how you run a human organization. Uh, the church is human. The church has divine qualities as well. But for us to operate it and function as a, a society, uh, it's the best way for it to happen. 
The Catholic Church administers seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, confession, anointing of the sick, holy matrimony, and holy orders. And it is through those great sacraments that people truly <coughs> have life-changing experiences and all the more draw closer to the Lord. The Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of baptism that gives new life to the soul that admits it into the body of Christ. This gift, the best of gifts, is given to infants. So the custom of the Catholic Church is to give the, the best thing that it can give to children. So I always, when people have their children baptized, I normally make the comment about the fact that any parent wants to give what's best to their child. Best food, best education, best diapers, best formula. They're gonna teach them English because we believe it's the best language. And we don't ask the child whether they want those things, we force them upon them. We don't ask the child whether they want to eat vegetables, we force them to eat vegetables. And we also believe that salvation in Christ Jesus is the, is the best thing for your child. So we don't ask the child, like, do you want to know Jesus? No, we say, you're going to love Jesus. At some point, the child has to make that decision, just like the child has to choose to speak English and choose to eat vegetables. We all know that the, the often children, at a certain point in their life, refuse to eat vegetables, and all they want to eat is candy. Uh, sometimes they go to college, and all they want to eat is beer, or um, things like that, and pizza. But then they ultimately realize that that's dumb. So it is a process as well that of, of their own acceptance, but we believe it is important for us to, to make that choice for them because it's the best choice uh, that can be made uh, by parents. The Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of confession, the means instituted by Jesus to obtain the forgiveness of sins after baptism. I love the way that this is phrased because it says the Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of confession because the sacrament of confession really is a joy. It really is, um, not just for me who gets to hear everybody's sins, but it is really a joy to see people's lives transformed. <coughs> it really is. The Catholic Church enjoys the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist that gives life to those who receive it on a regular basis. His very body and blood. The doctrines of the Catholic Church are unchangeable. Church teachings are not based on subjective beliefs or individual ministers or board of directors. Uh, we had two individuals who joined the church last year because of what's happening with our world and the issues of marriage and issues of of family and their churches making decisions, their whole congregation voting to making a decision to go against biblical teachings on marriage and family. And they said, both of them, they from different congregations were like, I'm done. I can't, I can no longer be a part of a, a congregation that, that claims to believe in the Bible, but then goes very contrary to it when it comes to such important issues as marriage and family. So th those are very, uh, sensitive issues, we'll talk about those issues um, in a very sensitive manner, but but the church in a very universal sense, it, it's not my choice to say like, gosh, like I've decided today that I think marrying whatever, your dog is a really good thing. Um, my cross country and track team is really, it's, it's so interesting. So I, I, I'm at East Central High School all the time and it's just like, it's a totally different world. Our world is like radically changing so um at all youth ministry events here at the parish um ladies are always first so like ladies eat first ladies whatever it is this is rachel helps out with youth ministry program here it's just the norm so yesterday we had cross-country practice and um the coach and i had chocolate milk which is like anyways there's all these studies on cho drinking chocolate milk directly after you do a workout that it's oh, whatever so anyway, we had chocolate milk for the kids and the office was locked and all of the boys were literally like pressing in on the door to like get the chocolate milk first and all the girls, there's a co-ed team, all the girls are like in the back of the hallway. So I have to push through the guys even to get to the door. I put my key in the door and I turn around and I said, ladies first. And one of the guys looks at me and he says, you can't say that, your father. I said, excuse me? He said, first of all, he said, maybe today I'm self-identifying as a lady. So... <laughs> This is a high school kid, <laughs> like, and he's 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 joking. But at the same time, they all know that they can do this. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I just said, I said, get out of here, like, go away, because I know that I know these kids like very very well. I was like, girls get up there, and a few of the guys actually they're like, no serious father, you realize that like you could get yourself totally in a lot of trouble right now. I was like, ladies first. I don't care what any of you say. Ladies first, get in here. And so the girls all got in and got their chocolate milk before the barbarians took over. Um, <laughs>
But it's, I mean, it really is, it, it, it is going to be crazy. It, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, uh, yeah. So, there you go. Anyways, okay. I tell stories about the CrossFit team quite a bit. They love it. Okay, um, sacred tradition has an important place in the Catholic Church during the first 400 years of the church. History, when there was no Bible, the entirety of Jesus' revelation was passed on to successive generations by apostolic tradition, sacred tradition. And number 20, the Catholic Church protects the sacrament of marriage. So there are 20 reasons, great reasons to be Catholic or great reasons to be here or great reasons to study. Like this is a, to learn more about the, these reasons of why the Catholic Church is who she is and why she believes what she does. Um, so on that note, we're going to take a short break because we try to, get, try to take a break and there's like cookies and food back there and coffee and you can walk around and use the restrooms which are right back there or say hello to people and then we're going to start up again in just a few minutes. So take a break. And Cindy, can I have you grab that light when I get the video started again? We're going to watch on the little screen. This is a text. Uh, this is the, this text is all going to be on the screen for those of you who can't see the screen or have poor eyesight or whatever. Um, so Fulton J. Sheen is just a he's a priest. He's actually originally from he was born in Peoria, Illinois, and ultimately became uh, a priest and a bishop. And in the 1960s and 70s had the top rated TV show in America that Protestants and Catholics watched alike. He, tremendous, tremendous orator and speaker. I truly believe that, I have a lot of, I have a lot of beliefs about uh, yeah, where we're going with speaking skills and abilities anymore in the world today. My undergraduate was, degree was in uh, communication, but like great or, or, oratory skills are like, they're dead and they're no longer even wanted or needed because of our soundbite culture has killed uh, the beauty of, of rhetoric. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I truly do, I, I live in 2017, but I do often wonder what it would have been like. So if I think back, like, okay, so think about when the, uh, this, this local area, founded in the, in the early 1820s and 30s. This church community here was founded in 1850. If you lived in this part of America at that time, you lived in a world of silence. There was no radio, there was no television. The only noise that you heard were of the animals on your farm, the children that you bore. You didn't talk on the phone to your neighbors. And the verb neighboring was something that you didn't do often every day. And when you worked, you worked in silence. There wasn't the sound of machines, there wasn't the sound of so like, if you're working out in the fields, you're, walk, you're working by yourself. Or you might be working with other people, but like you aren't talking the whole time. And you realize why parish halls were so important and why church communities were so important. Because that was their, people's only chance to like break the silence often. Particularly if you were a widow or a widower or like, and then you think about the importance of singing. Like that's why like communal singing is dead in our world right now. Another cross country story, we had a cross country meet in Connersville on Tuesday night. And um, the meet started with the with the uh, the national anthem. And normally it's very interesting. Go to a sporting event right now. The national anthem is a instrumental piece and no one sings. Or it's a soloist and no one sings. So my team had run out, before you run a race, you do these things called run out. So we had run out 
and I we were <coughs> huddled, and then they announced the national anthem. So we're kind of off by ourselves. So national anthem starts, and I'm somewhat being disrespectful a little bit, but I'm like, I'm going to sing the national anthem with whoever's singing because like, it's what you can do. So I sing the national, and they, my guys are all like, like looking over at me. So then they all start singing. So I'm just like, this is awesome. I have like seven guys, teenage boys, and they are singing the national anthem with Queen Soprano over there uh, in the microphone. I'm just like, this is fantastic because you want to let these guys probably never, ever, ever sing communally. But go back to the days in the 1800s. Why did people flock to the church? Because you heard music. Why did people flock to taverns? Because they had music and you could sing. So you just think about like human society, like in that sense, it was beautiful. And like people would like go to church because they'd love to hear orators. You know, some of the, the great <coughs> poets and people used to go to like coffee houses or whatever else or bars and people would get up and just recite poetry. Well, part of that was because they would then ponder it in silence for days. We're now like we're just bombarded with so much that like if you try to say something, it's just like one of many voices that you're going to hear that day and at that moment, and then like whatever you said, like good luck on people hearing it. And if you don't do something to get their attention, like it's just it's changed very very much. So, anyways, I believe that he was one of the the, the last great orators of the Catholic Church. If you ever want to hear amazing amazing talks, just go to YouTube or Lighthouse Catholic Media has tons and tons and tons of audio CDs of his, but his biblical, his understanding of the Bible, unbelievable. I love his, his interpretations of, of and, and he actually was very ecumenical, very engaged in, um, in so much, so much great stuff. But anyways, he has passed away and his cause is up uh, to be raised uh, as a Catholic saint. But he looks at this, at, he kind of takes an interesting point of view on the Catholic Church, and he says, if I was not a Catholic, he's a, he's a bishop, but he's like, if I was not a Catholic, but I was looking for the church that Christ founded, what would I look for? If I was not a Catholic, but I de determined to go on a search for what the, to look for the church that Christ founded, what would I look for? And I think that his, his response is, is, is beyond be beautiful, so uh, we'll look at this here. I think I got tired of me waiting. They got tired of me. And some of you will remember this song as well, so you can sing along. Well, you can don't sing along. People, people sing should really read. Okay, here we go. Oh, 
pain I have wept for love of them They turn away I will break their hearts of stone Give them hearts for love alone I will speak my word to them Whom shall I say? Here I am, Lord Is it I? I always find that just to be a great little presentation and it's worth some time actually if, if you want to to kind of read through this maybe a few more times and look at what Fulton J. Sheen is kind of putting forth but it, there's some really some great argumentation behind uh, what he's saying about the way that our and the more that we will study Christ and his church if we see that Christ is the head of the body or if Christ is the groom and the church is the bride then what is said of Christ is said of his body, the church, is said of his bride, the church, is said of um, of the church itself, because the two of them are united. Not saying that the sins of the church are Christ, or saying that the dysfunction of the church is Christ, because that's us. But that within its very being, of an essence of what the church was, int was intended to be, uh, we do find Christ. And particularly, the more and more that we find ourselves in conflict with the world, I think we see uh, that conflict really being with Christ uh, in, a, in, a, in a true sense. So, questions on any of these great things this evening? I will promise to be absolutely true that we will always end class by 8 o'clock and, if possible, end class early. So, today's going to be one of those days that we're going to end class a little early. Next week, we will have Bibles with you, but if you'd like to bring your Bible, you're always welcome to do so. Next week, we will be looking at uh, at the Bible, having presentations on how to, a tour through the Bible, understanding the Bible more. We, real, I, we realize that people are told that sometimes different spectrums of like, I've never opened a Bible, or I read my Bible every day. So we try to meet where people where they're at, but um, we want people to be very familiar particularly as we use the Bible, which we will in a lot of our classes when we start trying to either look at where does this come from, where is this, where is this in the scripture? I want you to have the comfort, the, to be comfortable to be able to say, I can, I can navigate my way through the Bible and understand where the Bible is, uh, is, is rooted in, and things of those sorts. So next week we'll be uh, on the Bible and we will be here with joy in our hearts. So let's uh, close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. We pray very much so today for peace. We pray for peace concerning the conflicts in North Korea. We pray for the many people that have been devastated by the recent hurricanes. People of Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico pray for the many individuals that will give of themselves to rebuild homes and, and lives. We pray that in our surplus of what we have been blessed with that we may always be 
ever mindful of those who have so little. Bless our evening, fill our hearts with joy in our choice to serve you and to follow you, and help us uh, to arrive safely tonight at our homes. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 And Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.